Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, looking at our room filling up, so we're just going to give it another minute or two before we get started. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, I think I see our numbers starting. Now I'll keep going. All right. All right, I think I'll go ahead and get us started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and happy Earth Week. Um, my name is Elena Cree. I am the head of the Climate and Energy Program at SDSN. Um, and we welcome you here today for this webinar on the Net Zero Campus Initiative, um, where we are going to feature our guide and accompanying toolkit uh, to help universities and colleges accelerate their climate action worldwide. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with SDSN, uh, we are a global network of universities and knowledge producing institutions. Uh, we have over 1700 members uh, currently around the world, organized in 53 national and regional networks. Um, and today you're going to hear some of the solutions that have come from that network uh, in this Net Zero Campus initiative. Uh, just to go over some quick housekeeping for how we are going to run today's webinar. Uh, you all should have access to the chat channel. Um, I see some interactions in there already. Uh, we'd love to welcome you to share your name and where you're calling in from so we can start cultivating a bit of a discussion there. Um, I also want to clarify that we are going to be using the Q&A portion of the Zoom. Um, so if you have questions throughout uh, the presentations, please put your questions in there. Uh, we'll turn to those at the end when we have a discussion portion. Um, additionally, I would welcome you all to already start to check out our guide and toolkit. Um, I believe our staff are going to put the link into the chat so you can get access to that. Um, and then I finally, I'd like to clarify, we are recording today um, and this meeting will be posted to the SDSN YouTube channel um, after the event. So just a quick rundown of our agenda. Um, so we're going to start today by hearing from Professor Jeffrey Sachs, the president of SDSN. Uh, we're then going to turn it directly over to Julie Topf, who is one of the authors of the guide. Uh, she's going to give you a bit of flavor of what kind of resources and advice that you can find in the guide, and also do a quick demo of our interactive online toolkit that accompanies it. Um, and then really excited to turn to three prestigious uh, case study presenters. Uh, we have speakers from our global advisory panel. Uh, they're gonna share some specific initiatives that they've been working on at their universities in the pursuit of this net zero campus goal. Um, and then at the end, we will start an interactive Q&A portion. Um, so we do encourage you all to please let us know your questions as we present, um, and we'll turn it over to you all then. And then finally, uh, we will be closing today with some special remarks from the Vice President of Networks from SDSN, uh, Maria Cortez Bush. So to kick us off today, um, Professor Sachs, welcome. I'm gonna turn it right over to you to share some opening remarks. Great, thank you very much, Elena, and uh, greetings to everybody. Uh, boy, it's exciting. I'm uh, just watching the flow in the uh, chat, uh, and I didn't catch everyone, but uh, we have uh, people uh, joining this discussion from Pakistan, Italy, Venezuela, United States, Greece, Mexico, Canada, Ecuador, Scotland, India, Colombia, Guyana, Jamaica, Bahrain, Oman, Germany, Norway, and more and more coming. So that's really wonderful uh, to be able to have a, a, a global rich discussion with uh, wonderful colleagues from all over the world. I really appreciate that. And I tremendously appreciate this new guide to net zero on campus and the toolkit that goes along with it. And it's a big team that has done this, uh, led by uh, Monash Energy Institute and Climate Works Australia. And thank you so much. And there's a wonderful international advisory board and fantastic SDSN uh, staff that have been part of this and the networks team. So there are lots and lots of people that are uh, part of this story. and. Uh, 
since I'm just the beneficiary to be able to read such an outstanding report, I just want to say thank you to all of the team. Now, what we have here is, is really a wonderful report, really, really smart. Um, it is about how campuses can do the uh, challenging work of bringing the campuses to net zero. And it's very analytical. It does it in, in the right way. Make a serious inventory. Understand all of the ways that the campus is part of greenhouse gas emissions, whether directly on campus or through supply chains. Understand what the best alternatives are, whether it's in the power sector or transport or buildings and facilities or other areas. Do the costing. Understand the financial options that uh, the campus faces. Uh, make the consultations, create the metrics, do the monitoring. It's really smart. It's really comprehensive. And it obviously serves, uh, I would say, three purposes. One, it's a tremendous guide to how to get to net zero on campuses, straight out. Second, it's a fantastic pedagogical tool because when students and faculty and university administrators and managers undertake this challenge, there will be a tremendous amount of learning. And one of the themes of this also is there is no off the shelf solution. Every campus, every place is distinctive what kinds of energy choices, what kinds of transport choices, what kinds of efficiency savings can be reached depend on context and depend on innovation. So innovation is part of the story everywhere. It doesn't have to be great breakthroughs in new technologies. It needs to be innovative ways to use tools that can be applied to the campuses. So first is actually getting the job done. It's the toolkit. Second, what a great learning experience, which is part of our mission at universities. And third, I just want to emphasize, while it's called net zero on campus, you could call it net zero for your city, for your country, uh, for a region, because really it's a toolkit that while directed at a campus is actually the right way to think about this problem. The right way to think about this problem is to understand the multiple sources of emissions, to understand then the choices regarding the elimination of those emissions from each of the sectors in terms of changes of technology, behavioral changes, or other approaches to substitute different ways to accomplish the same pattern, how to create metrics, how to create accountability, how to create a monitoring system. It works for a campus, it works for a city, it works for a national government. So I think that this is a very powerful approach. It's the rational approach to decarbonization. It's beautifully done. Again, I want to thank the team. I want to thank everybody for joining today from so many places in the world. We have a truly a global challenge. Uh, every place has to be engaged. Our campuses need to be thought leaders, educators, and promoters of solutions on campus and well beyond the campuses. So this is what Net Zero on Campus does. My thanks to everybody. Back over to you, Elena, for a wonderful session. And thanks, everybody around the world, for, for joining today. Thank you, Jeff. That was perfect. Um, I do also want to just emphasize 
one point you just made about learning. Uh, we are not going to have all of the answers in our presentations today, and we know that you all have unique experiences at your own institutions. So we're really hoping to set this up as a shared learning experience so that we can really accelerate this transition to net zero. So thank you, Jeff, for joining us. Um, so at this point, I think I will ask Julie Toff, uh, the program co coordinator for the climate and energy uh, group here at SDSN, uh, to give us a presentation. She's going to go over what this guide actually has and also how to use the online toolkit. Julie, over to you. Thank you, Elena. Hi, everyone. My name is Julie Toff, and I'm from SDSN's climate and energy team. And I'm also one of the co-authors of the Net Zero on-campus guide, which we are so excited to be sharing with you all today. And in addition to sharing information about the guide itself, I'll also be sharing more about the other components of this wider Net Zero on-campus initiative and how you can all be a part of it by joining our global community of practice. Our Net Zero on Campus project was really born out of our recognition of the fact that thousands of universities around the world have already pledged to reach net zero by 2050, while hundreds are expected to already reach net zero as early as 2030 and 2040. So we created this project to give universities the information and the tools they need to act on and realize these commitments, while also building a global community of practice for colleges and universities around the world to support each other in their decarbonization journeys. The initiative was led by the Climate and Energy team at SDSN, Monash University, a leading public research university in Australia, and the Climate Works Center, a nonprofit organization in Australia that works to advance both research and climate action in Australia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Now, Monash University, a longtime member of SDSN, actually approached us with the idea of this project to be able to share their own firsthand experience with decarbonization on campus with other universities around the world through SDSN's global network. So together, SDSN mobilized its member universities from around the world to collect case studies and input from different kinds of institutions across different regions, while Monash and the Climate Work Center mobilized their world-leading research and own ambitious net zero initiative experience. And we also couldn't have done this without the support from our partners, Second Nature and the EAUC, which serves as a secretariat for the race to zero for universities and colleges. And we're very grateful for their, all the essential guidance that they provided us throughout the development of this initiative. Now in the scoping and development of this project, we really made it a priority to focus on filling in the gaps that we found in the literature and the resource pool. So we, we definitely recognize that a wide array of resources and tools already exist to help support climate action on university and, and college campuses. Um, but we really, through this project, aim to build on them and link to them. And we've collected, organized, and again, put them all together in one central repository to make them easily accessible and searchable in a one-stop shop of global key resources. And unlike the majority of other resources, we really focused on diving deeply into campus operations, providing up-to-date why and how-to information, sharing detailed case studies from across different regions to be representative of different contexts, and providing strategies to also empower students to help drive change on their own campuses, because we recognize that most of the resources out there actually target the university administration level. So we wanted to also provide strategies to help students drive change on their own campuses. Now, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, our Net Zero on Campus initiative consists of more than just our guide and is actually made up of three different components. So the Net Zero on Campus Guide is a standalone report that relates to the online toolkit. And the guide provides high level strategies, guiding principles, and is really meant to inform the why and the what aspects of all the different factors that fall under a university or college's net zero journey. And the accompanying online toolkit is a digital platform hosted on the SCSN website that relates directly to the guide. And this online toolkit provides a wide selection of open source resources, case studies, 
and links to other existing databases and platforms like those provided by Second Nature and the Race to Zero and the EAUC in order to provide universities with the tools they need to start and accelerate their net zero journeys. So it's really meant to inform the how aspects of campus decarbonization. And finally, the global community of practice, which we are so excited to announce will be launched soon after this event, we will be a digital platform that allows users to directly share resources and communicate with one another to provide a space for college and university sustainability practitioners to engage with each other and learn from one another on an ongoing basis. And we invite you to express your interest in joining this community of practice. You can do so by accessing the form at the link at the bottom of the screen or by accessing the link. I'm sure the team will be sharing it in the chat shortly, but definitely fill out that form so that you can stay up to date on the latest announcements for the global community of practice. And so together, all of these three components will equip universities and colleges with both the knowledge and the tools that they need to accelerate their climate action plans while also creating new communities of practice among them. So we designed the project to be used by a variety of campus stakeholders in order to enable both the bottom up and the top down action needed to achieve systems wide decarbonization. These groups include campus sustainability managers, campus administration and facilities operators, university board members and directors, and student bodies, because all of these different groups have direct control over their campus operations. And as a quick note, the, the structure of the guide was also designed to facilitate its use among different university departments. So for example, the fi finance teams, facilities teams, and administration teams can easily refer to the sections that are most relevant to them and their needs. And the initiative was also designed to be suitable for universities and colleges of different sizes and regions, as well as decarbonization experiences in progress, ranging from those that find themselves at the pre-commitment stage to those that are already ready for implementation. And in order to ensure that the initiative accounts for the various geographical, institutional, and cultural needs of different universities in a balanced manner, the project team actually sent out an initial scoping survey to a variety of different universities around the world in order to gain different insights about the different kinds of commitments, projects, and challenges that universities are facing across different regions when we were in the scoping phase of this project. And then in order to ensure that diverse needs and perspectives were truly embedded throughout the development of the whole project, we formed a fantastic university advisory panel made up of university and facilities managers from regions across the world. And our advisors provided their expert input as end users of this guide and the community of practice. They also shared case studies, testimonials, and firsthand experiences to contribute to the content of the guide and the toolkit, some of which we'll hear about today. And with all of this expert input, our guide highlights these high level principles in order to enable the most efficient implementation of a net zero campus journey. So building institutional structures is crucial to help prepare and implement decarbonization projects in ways that drive transparency, accountability, and also equitable stakeholder participation. A comprehensive net zero plan should also aim to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions across scopes one, two, and three, and must target reaching net zero emissions by or before the year 2050, while also setting medium-term interim targets so that universities can enable the timely review of their performance all the way on the road to, on the road to mid-century. And these long and medium-term targets should be backed by ambitious actions that demonstrate tangible and immediate emissions reductions to help secure support from key stakeholders. And universities can get even more of this support and buy-in from key stakeholders by conducting cost-benefit analyses that evaluate both the financial and non-financial costs of, and benefits of net zero initiatives in order to build evidence-based and really robust plans. And of course, continuously reviewing progress toward net zero will help promote accountability, transparency, and also help 
universities ensure that they're leveraging the latest developments in climate science, innovation, finance, and policy. And finally, by building alliances, networks, and communities of practice like this one, campus decarbonization efforts can be accelerated at the pace we need it to happen in order to actually reach net zero within the next few decades. Now, while keeping all of these guiding principles in mind, colleges and universities can realize their journeys to net zero through a variety of different initiatives. And in our project, we have identified 17 different practical campus initiatives across these action areas of energy, mobility, facilities, waste and recycling, procurement, and also those that extend beyond campus operations. And the content in both the standalone guide and the accompanying online toolkit correspond to each of these campus action areas and all the initiatives that fall under them. Now, the first five action areas focus on the biggest sources of campus emissions, but emissions reductions can be accomplished across all these areas. For example, through reducing campus energy demand and sourcing renewable energy, encouraging sustainable travel and a transition to zero emission vehicles, sustainable building practices, circular economy principles, sustainable procurement practices across supply chains, exercising climate leadership, engaging with student bodies and through education, research and innovation. And in the guide, each initiative is detailed with an overview, benefits and challenges, and resources to inform their implementation on different campuses. And in addition to the resources highlighted throughout the guide, a greater, a greater variety of tools can also be found in our online toolkit. And now I'll be sharing examples of the different kinds of information that our guide provides for two different types of initiatives in order to give everyone a better sense of the kind of content covered in our guide. So one of the initiatives that falls under the campus action area is reducing campus energy demand. And experts around the world have identified four key approaches to reducing emissions from the energy sector, which are known as the four pillars of decarbonization. The first of these four pillars focuses on efficiency, conservation, and reducing energy demand which is the focus of this specific initiative. So reducing campus energy demand can be carried out through a variety of different strategies that we highlight in our guide, including switching to LED lighting and minimizing HVAC run times, utilizing smart technologies to improve energy efficiency, such as occupancy sensors, to eliminate any unnecessary lighting, heating and cooling of empty rooms, using energy management systems to manage demand, also exploring innovative solutions such as altering the academic calendar to help improve energy use and efficiency, and involving both students and staff to implement energy saving campaigns to help further encourage even more interstakeholder engagement in decarbonization efforts. And the impacts of all these different kinds of strategies can be measured by reduced emissions, reduced consumption of energy, and cost savings. And cross-cutting benefits of reducing campus energy demand include targeting a key source of scope one and scope two emissions, resource conservation, overall community benefits, including climate mitigation, and all of the amazing co-benefits associated with that, both immediate and long-term financial savings, and energy security for the university or college and also the wider community. And challenges that may arise include resistance to change, both at the systemic and individual level, a lack of data, skills, and capacity within the university or college, the lack of financing for upfront costs, and also the non-availability of energy efficient alternatives, especially as seen in low and middle income countries. Now, just to shift gears a little bit, I also wanted to highlight one of our non-operations focused initiatives. And engaging with student bodies is key because students can be significant agents of change for climate action on campus. Students make up the majority of university and college populations and are also the principal consumers of their goods and services. 
And campus decarbonization projects can be designed, operated, and monitored by students under faculty supervision. And they can also be carried out through collaborative student, faculty, and facility teams that ensure equitable partnerships across stakeholder groups. So integrating student engagement within existing student requirements and existing networks can actually help lower barriers to participation. So for example, students can be allowed to collaborate in climate action as part of their actual studies, such as by conducting greenhouse gas inventories or campus environmental audits as class projects. And student engagement also needs to be integrated into institutional governance arrangements, which is particularly important in order to ensure that student engagement is systematically embedded into campus sustainability and decarbonization efforts in the long term. And of course, providing financial support to student-led initiatives is key to the durability of student engagement. And more details on specific ways to accomplish these different strategies can be found both in our guide and online toolkit. But the impacts of such actions can be measured by, measured by overall emissions reduced, the financing of student-led organizations and initiatives, and also the actual involvement of students in campus initiatives. And student participation in campus decarbonization efforts can not only foster their professional development, but also their ability to further contribute to either their own institutions or the wider community sustainability objectives. So through research, employment, and project experience, students can gain meaningful experiential learning and hands-on experiences that can help them accelerate and drive real positive impact. And I, I can personally attest to all these benefits and experiences because I helped lead campus-wide sustainability initiatives and also conducted research as an undergraduate student. And I'm still applying all of the skills that I learned from both of these experiences in my position here at SDSN and also through the climate-related volunteer work that I do in my local community. And some of the challenges that may arise when trying to engage with students in decarbonization efforts include resistance to building collaborative and equal partnerships with students, and also the need to avoid greenwashing because many times initiatives can be heavily promoted without actually having a significant impact on decarbonization. Now our accompanying online toolkit, which can be found on SDSN's website, contains various resources that can be used to actually implement the initiatives described in the guide, including the ones that I just went through right now. And the resources in our online toolkit can be filtered by a variety of different characteristics in order to help you find the tools most applicable to your needs or university. So for example, they can be filtered by the theme they cover, the action area and initiative they correspond to, the type of resource, and also decarbonization, the decarbonization stage of the university. So how much net zero experience it already has. Now, all this information is available for your reference on our website, but I did want to point out the wide variety of different types of resources that we provide in our online toolkit. They include commitments, databases, reports, web pages, massive, op open, op massive open online courses and videos. And if you have any types of these resources that you would like to share, we encourage you to do so during our discussion session after the presentations in this webinar, in which we will provide attendees a 60 second opportunity to share these kinds of tools and resources. And we also encourage you to submit your resources to be featured in our online toolkit after this webinar by following the instructions on our website. Now I'm going to briefly walk us through how to use the online toolkit. I'm just gonna open up our toolkit. Okay, so the, the first step to using our online toolkit is navigating to our project page on the SCSN website. And I'm sure our team will be sharing the link for that in the chat soon. And then to scroll down to our table of contents where you can find the link to access our online toolkit. Clicking this link will take you directly to the place where all of our resources and case studies are stored for your use. 
And the next step is to choose which campus action area corresponds to the kind of resources and tools that you're looking for. So like I described them before, these campus action areas cover energy, mobility, facilities, and others. And you can simply navigate to the tools that correspond to your needs by clicking one of these links. But for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll be showing an example of one of our energy related resources. So clicking this resources and case studies link will take you to the respective page for that campus action area. And like I mentioned before, all of the instructions and details about what kind of filters can be used are listed right there for your reference. If you're searching for a specific tool or resource, you can scroll down a little bit and you'll see them all in this grid format here. And if you're looking for a case study, you can simply scroll down a little bit more past the resources and you'll see all of the case studies that were submitted by universities around the world related to that specific campus action area, which in this case is energy. But just to give you a little bit more guidance on how to navigate our library of resources, we recommend that you use an actual desktop for the best view, and you can expand this library to see the full collection by clicking this expansion button right here in the bottom right corner. That will automatically open the full resource library for that specific action area. And like I mentioned, there's a wide selection of a lot of different resources, but we have created specific filters that we, you can easily use to narrow down your search. So for example, I will be searching for a, a resource, a tool related to an initiative. Sorry about that. Related to an initiative that deals with installing campus microgrids. And then I'll also want that specific resource to be in the form of an informational web page. So as you can see, by playing around with these filters, they can significantly help you narrow down your search and also find the resources that are most suitable to your needs at the moment. And then by clicking on the resources that pop up based on your filter search, you can get all of the details you need about the specific resource and then actually access the link to, to open up the resource that you are interested in checking out. And those, that's it. That's how you can easily find all of the global resources that we've compiled um, for your reference. So now I'm going to navigate back to the presentation. We are so excited to be sharing this initiative with you all today and invite you to be a part of it in a variety of different ways. So this QR code will take you directly to our project website where you can access this information and all the different links you can use to get involved. And we invite you to share your own case studies and resources to be featured in our online toolkit. And we also invite you to join our community and learn more about the SDGs. So like I mentioned before, we're currently collecting expressions of interest for this global community of practice that we will launch shortly. And we invite you to fill out the form by visiting the link that you can find in the bottom of the screen and also in our chat or by scanning the QR code. And those that fill out the form will be notified of next steps. And finally, we also invite you to use these free use all of the free courses and resources provided by SDSN's SDG Academy in your classrooms and beyond. And joining our community of practice can give you access to the expertise of campus sustainability practitioners around the world, including our own amazing university advisory panel members who will now share some of their own decarbonization work. And I'll now turn it over to Dr. Devon Smith, the state manager of the Mona campus of the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. So Devon, whenever you're ready, we'd love to hear your presentation. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Julie. Very comprehensive presentation, might I add, and I know that Certainly with the participants, I know that they are very excited to hear what, um, what you have said. A happy Earth Week to all that is actually on. Um, uh, Julie, will I be doing my um, sharing my slides or you will be doing it? I'll share them for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So um, my job today is to present to you um, what it is that we at Mona is actually doing in terms of our journey towards uh, full decarbonization. And this presentation is looking at the heavy fuel oil, moving away from that, to liquid natural gas, LNG, and certainly to talk about one renewable um, initiative, energy initiative that we have going forward. Next slide. So to provide um, context, um, the University of the West Indies Mona campus is located in Jamaica, 652 acres of property, uh, two and a half million um, kilowatt per hour energy consumption, 570 buildings that we have. We have an employment um, staff of uh, 3,000. Our current enrollment is slightly lower than what you're seeing there on screen, um, lower than the 19,000. Typical campus engagement, um, seven faculties, administrative, institutional, and the support services. We have residential um, housing for faculty members, uh, student services. We have 10 halls of residence amounting to 10,500 beds and of course, sports and recreational uh, facilities. Next slide. So we recognize that as a small developing state, it is very critical that we get on board and certainly University of the West Indies Mona campus recognize the need to play leadership where that is concerned. So the first thing that we did was to certainly align our, our vision with the Jamaica Vision 2030 National Goal which is healthy natural environment, sustainable management, and of course, adaptation to climate change. And as I pointed out earlier, very important for small uh, Caribbean developing state. Um, what we did um, is to align our strategic plan as well as our mass, um, campus master plan to look at transformation of our energy system models. And uh, Julie spoke about um, the seven initiatives um, that, that, that the toolkit has, and that is how we have aligned ourselves. Engagement to redesign our fleet operation. We are looking at going into electric vehicle. In fact, I can report that we have actually uh, finalized uh, partnership with the government to actually start a pilot project. So that is very exciting for us. And of course, um, develop greener initiatives to reduce carbon emission through the built environment. And of course, um, ultimately that engagement to reach to net zero by 2050. Next slide. So this is our energy profile um, here at Mona. As you can see, uh, we have 47% uh, um, in terms of cooling of the facility, followed by lighting. Lighting, And we recognize that that in, in terms of actually carrying it out was very expensive. Added to that, we had to do a number of initiatives. We had to develop the medical, a new medical facility, a new call center as part of advancing our commercial activities and the establishment of the faculty of law. And we recognize with all three developments, we were actually adding to the already enormous energy uh, consumption bill. So we recognize that we had to redesign our focus where we wanted to go. And the first thing that we recognize is that we needed to come off the national grid and move to a microgrid. Where is it that we can manage our energy requirements and need? And coming out of that, next slide, please. Coming out of that, we establish our own microgrid which is our own energy. So this is how we have decided to move from HFO off the national, uh, national grid onto having our own private grid and where we are uh, producing a maximum output of seven megawatt of power. Now, moving away from the LNG, from the HFO to the LNG, you recognize that that is a reduction in the carbon footprint. We also recognize that to utilize the heating from the uh, from the engine would be able to cool a number of those new facilities which I spoke about earlier. So what we did was to trap that heat, run it through an absorption chiller and the cooling towers, and thereby creating cooling for those three buildings that I spoke about earlier. So again, a further reduction in the in the carbon footprint. Next slide, please. And through that initiative, what we have discovered, and this is now early calculation that we have, is that according to the EPA um, greenhouse um, calculator, is that we recognize that we have net out at 8.2 million kilowatt per hour, 
which equivalent to 3,560 3, metric ton of carbon dioxide that we have, that we have removed. Um, equivalent again, 8,242 barrels of oil. And again, 767 gallons of powered um, um, gasoline powering passenger vehicle for one year or over. And, then, and, and as well, um, over 400,000 gallons of gasoline. And the last um, equivalent um, chart that we have is that equivalent to carbon sequestered by 58, just over 58,000 uh, uh, tree seedlings grown over a 10-year period. So you see it, how it is that we have been engaged to actually reduce our carbon footprint. In fact, what, what the next initiative that we are looking at is actually establishing a solar uh, power plant, solar plant here at Mona, which would certainly carry um, our carbon footprint much lower. Next slide, please. Now, I can't close by not recognizing that we have established our first net zero building here at UWI Mona, which was spearheaded by professors da, Dasgupta, Tara Dasgupta, who is now um, deceased, but continuing the championing in ensuring um, the advancement of it is um, Professor Clayton. And if my memory serves well, I believe that Dr. David Smith, who is head of the Sustainable Development um, Department here, he's also online. So we continue to ensure that we can advance the initiative. And certainly we look forward to um, present our report, our um, findings with the utilization of this net zero building. Next slide, please. So some of the some of the challenges that we have encountered as a small developing state and certainly as a university, limited financial resources, um, and that is the, the number one the number one factor for us. Um, reduction in government subvention. So we have to be very creative. How is it that we can identify funding? There's a there's a lack of urgency, and that is something that we really need to see. How is it that we can advance the, the, uh, the conversation within our constituency and certainly take it out um, um, to, the wider, to the wider domain, as Prof. Sachs has um, pointed out. Um, again, limited access to financial resources, but this is actually on the international, um, at the international level. And this is where we are seeking to see how is it that we can engage funding agencies, right, to partner, to participate with us in how is it that they can uh, fund our initiative. As I pointed out um, earlier, partnering with the government, and I should also point out um, UNDP is part of that initiative for the e-mobility um, initiative. So that is the type of partnership that we are seeking to um, look to establish. Uh, knowledge deficiency and um, uh, carbonization, again, linked to um, item two, low research um, output in the region. Um, again, we here at Mona, we have started to establish the framework. How is it that we can create that space, that living laboratory? How is it that we can have the data and how is it that we can conduct our research so that we can participate in um, robust discussion right across? And of course, we have the cultural um, the cultural aspect to it. And this is something that it, just continual conversation will ensure that we can, we, can, we can change that mindset. And the last one that I have here is the organization and governance infrastructure. And I'm happy to report that we here at Mona we are now seeking how is it that we can now incorporate, entrench within our uh, governance infrastructure um, decarbonization. So it is not just in a in a very fragmented way, but it is a collective effort at this policy making uh, decision makers here at Mona, and that is how it is that we are seeking to um, ensure that level of entrenchment. So that is what we are here doing at, um, here at Mona in terms of advancing the uh, decarbonization initiative. Thank you very much. And I look forward for any questions um, thereafter. Perfect. Thank you, Devon. We do have one question for you, but I'm going to ask us to hold it until we turn to our discussion portion. Sure. Sure. Um, and, and just to comment, uh, in the spirit of collaboration and joint learning, I bet Julie might have some ideas of how you could activate a student body to help you with that lack of urgency Absolutely. issue. Students Absolutely. are really good at that. Yes. 
Indeed. Wonderful. Thank you. thank you. Great. So thank you, Devon. We'll we'll bring you back for the discussion portion, but um, for the moment, may I ask Dr. Esti Sayez to uh, turn on your camera for your presentation? Um, Esti is the Head of Sustainability and Social Commitment at the University of the Basque Country, Associate Professor in the area of Environmental Technologies, and Vice President of REDS SDSN Spain. Welcome, Esti. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good night, everyone. Thanks a lot for joining this event. And first, I would like to thank Helen, Julie, Aaron for the opportunity to participate in this initiative in my capacity of Vice President of SDSN Spain and Director of Sustainability of the University of the Basque Country as a member of the advisory board. Uh, it has been a pleasure working with this team and it was very successful and I learned a lot. So thank you. This guide, uh, from my point, it was completely necessary because it's more urgent than ever to restore the relationship between people and planet. And very, very especially if you have responsibilities con connected with environmental management and you don't know what to do. So here you can find a large uh, list of initiatives and some clues in order to adapt and, and to implement them in your institutions. And I'm sure that it will be your bedtime reading for the following months. It has been my bedtime reading, or it was my the previous week. So uh, please consider it because it's going to be very helpful. Today, I'm going to briefly present your initiative of the University of the Basque Country, quite different, um, but quite useful. And we launched a sustainability living challenge in order to involve the university community in the fight against climate change, but from the individual or by changing individual behaviors. We just started with it uh, the previous academic year, I mean, in 2021, 2022. And this initiative is the, the Planet App. It's a mobile application designed to reduce the individual carbon footprint. It's something like a game, but it works. <laughs> It's focused on climate action to support users in reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by, by changing or by, by modifying their lifestyle habits to more sustainable habits. And, but we also consider some other challenges of the 2030 agenda, such as uh, responsible consumption and environmental uh, impact of products, sustainable habits at home and on campus regarding energy, the SDG number seven, sustainable transport, cities and communities, SDG 11, food for climate change, uh, health and well-being, SDG number three. Okay, as you can see in this figure, this app includes a diagnosis or a, a quite a, a general calculation of the individual carbon footprint. It's not super accurate, but it's more or less an approximation. And it's disaggregated in four different areas. It's uh, home, transportation, food, and uh, lifestyle. And uh, the users can compare the, their carbon footprint, the individual car carbon footprint with the world average, with the, the average in our region, in the past country, with some other users of, of this app. And, uh, and, and then uh, after calculating or making this diagnosis, the app proposes to the users different challenges. Uh, these challenges, okay, they are perhaps the typical ones, but they are disaggregated a lot, such as cutting meat consumption, buying local products, cutting back and flying, leaving the car or motorcycle at home, reducing energy use. And they are presented as very, very small uh, challenges. Uh, there are more than 150. And the participants can select every week some new challenges. Mm, how many? It depends on the level of commitment of the of the participants with global warming. Some of them just select two, some other ones select twelve uh, challenges every week. So it depends on the on their level of commitment. Okay, please the next slide. This app, apart from the recommendations, uh, in order to reduce the carbon footprint, includes some short courses or training pills in order to justify why is it important to change these habits, um, what's happening in our climatic system, uh, what's happening with, uh, with uh, our meteorology and climatology, what's circular economy, uh, how can we move uh, to new energy models, uh, how to help this energy transition, 
We also include some news, some good practices, some information. Okay, next slide, please. So it's uh, as it was a game, users can learn. They pass to upper levels, to upper levels of commitment. They progress, they play, and they set personal goals. And they can create a personal plan to reduce their carbon footprint here in the in the app. And they can track their their uh, they can track the daily impacts and the daily and the daily habits. Uh, the ones that are most committed reducing their environmental impact, they receive different kinds of prizes, not super big prizes, but some recognition and small, small prizes. Um, and and they, we also we also publish it in order to, to have this public recognition. Okay, next slide, please. And here you can see the results that we obtained. Uh, we have more than 2,200 participants, including students, staff, and some former students. This represents more or less the 5% of our university community. So the results are quite good, or at least for us. From this, uh, more than the 70% are current students, and this is excellent because they, they, we are sure that they are going to be ambassadors of this fight against climate change. Um, once they finish uh, their studies in their future works and uh, jobs and as citizens. In this last year, we have reduced nearly 1,000 tons of CO2 thanks to these changes, apart from the some other structural changes and that we did in the university, but this thanks to these changes in individual behaviors. Um, and we have had more or less more than 30,000 weekly uh, habits committed and more than 20 weekly completed successfully, which is quite good because this means that once they commit with one habit, they, they complete it or they, 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 their success rate is quite high. The same quite good results for these, uh, for these short courses because uh, the participants have complete or the success rate of the participants that uh, that uh, that give the name in a course it's over the 77 percent which is a lot for an online course and you can find more you can find more information in our website or if you want more information uh, you can contact me you can contact us the team of SDSN or, or Spain or, or the University of the Basque Country. And we look forward to learning and sharing our experience with, with you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Esti. What a practical solution. Uh, there was a quick question about if other campuses can use the app, and I'm not sure uh, if that's possible. It looks really impressive. I think there's appetite. <laughs> Not directly because we have a specific code, but uh, the, the, it was developed by an enterprise. We collaborate with them and um, because they adapted to our special language to Basque. But I'm sure that uh, if, uh, I can provide you the contact of the developers and they are very, I'm sure that perhaps they can develop a special version or with a specific code for some different universities because they are doing it at least in Spain and in, in Southern Europe. Perfect. Absolutely. I think even learning how the process of the development and where it came about and then the contracting, all of that is really helpful. Um, and this is a perfect example addressing that age old adage, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so I think this is a really powerful tool to understand how your individual behavior impacts this larger global challenge. So thank you for that. that this was perfect. Um, so we have one more presentation. I'm going to now ask Dr. Luki Anderson. Um, who is a D Danish economist who has conducted research on environment and development in Latin America for more than 25 years. And she is currently serving as executive director of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network in Bolivia. Uh, Luki, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the SDSN team for inviting me to participate in this initiative. It has been a great experience and uh, simultaneously to developing the, the guide uh, we've been uh, calculating our uh, net zero report for Universidad Privada Boliviana. Um, and we just finished it yesterday, really. <laughs> it took more time than I'd expected. And literally like 15 minutes ago, it was published. So we'll launch today uh, on the occasion of the 
of, of this event as well. Next slide, please. So this is uh, our report. Uh, it calculates the, the, the carbon footprints for the three campuses we have in Bolivia. Next slide. And uh, it has been a very useful exercise to actually figure out what are the problems and what are not problems uh, in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, all our campuses are located kind of far away from the residential areas of each city. So the biggest uh, the footprint tend to be from transportation to and from campus by the students and the staff. Uh, we have one campus that was only launched uh, or it opened like one week before the pandemic started. So we only have data for 2022. Uh, it has kind of big emissions in in uh, food. So also scope scope three, scope one and two are very small uh, on our campuses, but scope three, mainly transportation and food. Uh, mainly due to uh, people eating red meat on campus. Red meat causes a lot of deforestation in Bolivia, so high carbon emissions. Uh, in total, our emissions from the three campuses for an, an entire year is only 3,105 tons of carbon, which is very small, actually. It's less than 0.002% of, of Bolivia's entire carbon emissions. But we did we have done some uh, initiatives to try to reduce them. Next slide, please. So all campuses have solar panels and we calculated how many tons of carbon that has saved and it turns out to be 39 per year. So it's not a lot <laughs> really. Uh, it's uh, because the, the electricity in Bolivia is already quite uh, green. So uh, this kind of initiatives is mainly cosmetic. <laughs> it doesn't have a really big impact. Um, we also had done a lot of tree planting and we calculated how much carbon those trees are absorbing and it turned out to be only eight tons. So it's really, really small impacts of, of, of those initiatives. Next slide, please. So, in our experience, uh, it has been very useful to, 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 to make this report, to get a sense of proportions and be able to distinguish between real solutions and like greenwashing, really. <laughs> and by all means, we should try to reduce excessive emissions. Uh, so in, in our case, it would be to get people, students to use bus or carpooling more and eat less red meat. Uh, but I really wouldn't uh, recommend spending too much time and effort on getting to zero emissions on campus because like the, the resources and time uh, and energy of, of researchers and students are limited and they could potentially have a much bigger impact if they focus on the bigger problems outside campus. So for example, in the case of Bolivia, if uh, our researchers and students could help reduce deforestation in Bolivia by just 1%, marginal reduction, then our university would not only be net zero, but rather like minus 1 million tons. So you really have to, to choose where to uh, focus the efforts on and that that has been my recommendation uh, all the time but uh, yeah it, it is very useful to get a sense of of proportions to to do these calculations and it has been a great way to actually involve students and interns uh, on this kind of of calculations and problems thank you Thank you, Luki. Uh, also, please feel free to drop the link to your report in the chat so that the participants can check it out. Um, I think it's also just really interesting 
we see different universities, you know, draw the boundaries of their emissions profiles differently. So where you found transport being the largest, I think a lot of others, we've found that buildings are the largest and the biggest part of buildings is the heating and cooling, very much like Devon showed us also in the Mona uh, emissions profile. And there's only so much agency we have as faculty or practitioners or sustainability managers to change out that level of infrastructure. But I think overall, all efforts are important, right? We need to use our campuses as living labs to really learn how we can take this initiative forward and develop these technologies or solutions, um, but also realizing uh, in retrospect, uh, what are the priorities and where else you can have additional um, impact outside the campus. So thank you very much. Um, so before we turn uh, to our uh, discussion portion, um, we're going to try to uh, facilitate a bit of an interactive session here. Um, so first, thank you to those of you who have been putting questions in the Q&A box. I see we have several and we will turn to those momentarily and ask our speakers to answer them. Um, but also, uh, before we do that, I want to share, I want to have a brief moment if you'll all participate in this experiment with me. Um, and we're going to open up the microphone for the participants who perhaps have a related challenge, initiative, or solution that they would like to share. Um, and this is all in the spirit of cultivating this shared learning and community of practice that Julie mentioned earlier. Um, so we do have uh, a few uh, of our colleagues who have reached out ahead of the webinar and volunteered. Um, and I'm going to ask that we keep these interventions to 60 seconds. And I will be strict because I do want to make sure that we have time to get to the questions that have been answered. And we only have a half hour left. Um, so I'm going to say your name. Our staff will then unmute you and then welcome you to share a challenge, solution, or intervention related to net zero. Um, and hopefully spur some additional brainstorming um, for our webinar. Um, so Charlotte Bonner, the new CEO of the Alliance for Sustainability Leadership in Education, and also I believe part of the Secretariat for the Race to Zero campaign. Um, Charlotte, would you like to uh, share your intervention quickly? Good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much. So yeah, we are a membership organisation for further education, TVET and higher education institutions across the UK and Ireland. And we support our members to embed sustainability and climate action at the heart of their education work. And we're proud to have supported the development of both the Net Zero on Campus Guide that's been launched today and to provide the Secretary for the Race to Zero Universities and Colleges campaign, which Julie mentioned earlier on in her presentation. So Race to Zero is a global campaign Campaign run by UNFCCC to rally and recognize leadership and support from businesses, cities, regions, investors, and universities and colleges that not only achieves net zero, but creates healthy, resilient, and um, zero carbon recovery. The Race to Zero criteria is set by an expert peer review group, which comprises scientific and technical experts from around the world. So Race to Zero Universities and Colleges is an official part of this campaign, and it's delivered by ourselves in partnership with UN Environment and Second Nature. So 1,145 universities and colleges have demonstrated leadership to date by joining Race to Zero Universities and Colleges as signatories and they collectively serve over 10 million students. Um, we're supported by high-level climate champions, so there's a very high profile of signatories at COP, um, and that will continue with Razanel Mubarak's support at COP28. And finally, just to say that we support signatories in their journey with a wealth of videos, case studies, resources, toolkits, and guides, and we're really delighted to have contributed to this guide that's being launched today as part of that. And I'll put the link to Race to Zero in the chat box. I hope that was 60 seconds or that, thereabouts. That was perfect, Charlotte. Thank you. And, and I love that example, too, because while our guide is very much focused on kind of grassroots efforts, the campus, the operations, the Race to Zero campaign involves encompassing the, the leadership, the presidents, the university leadership to really commit, which then is kind of a top down effort. So we need we, we all know we need both. Um, so please, if you're not familiar with the Race to Zero, check it out. Um, it's a really important global initiative. Thanks, um, and great example, Charlotte. Others can follow your suit and being brief and quick. So that was perfect. Um, George Malandrakis, would you like to uh, intervene next? And I'll give you 60 seconds, George. 
Good evening, good morning from Greece, from Aristotle University. We are all over the world. Thank you for the invitation and for and for this event and for the development of this uh, net zero guidelines. Uh, I would just want to inform our guests here that uh, we have made a similar work and we have developed a tool, an online tool, uh, calculating the ecological footprint of universities where the the carbon footprint and the energy footprint is also included. Um, and we have already made actual uh, implementation of this, uh, of this tool to several universities. More details about this uh, calculator will be presented by Serena Mancini, which is also participating in this event. I will just to note that we sometimes, the most interesting um, finding from our study was that the indirect foot ecological footprint of universities, meaning indirect the energy for our transportation to and for the university or the energy we use at home working for the university or the food we consume in food for the university is what is was about the double of the direct ecological footprint of universities. So we have also in mind this, this parameter. Thank you for, uh, for uh, this event and Serena will provide you more details about our uh, calculator. Thank you, George. Indeed, it starts at university, but doesn't end there, right? At least for our context today, it's also important um, what, how we travel in our own personal lives. Um, great. Serena, do you want to jump in then and explain the EU steps calculator that George mentioned? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, George, for the introduction. So yes, within the USTEP project, which is an European uh, funded uh, project under the Erasmus Plus program, we developed an open access online tool that is the University Footprint Calculator that is based on a standardized approach to measure the ecological footprint and thus allows all the universities monitor and manage the use of natural resources and ecosystem service necessary for running all the activities and operation. So I'd like here to highlight that as George also mentioned, this is not just a carbon footprint, but this is a tool that measure all the natural resources that the university are using for their operation as well as the ecosystem service needed to sequester the co2 so it's like a step beyond the the, the carbon footprint and the, the co2 uh, emission just to be give an example if we think at the canteens in the university um we are measuring uh, the, the tool is measuring not only the the co2 emission but also the the area of crop grazing and fishing that the university appropriating to produce the food that is giving to the students and all and all the staff um, so this tool uh, really allows to the university to from a situation where usually universities don't know where they where their impact are to a situation where university realize i mean identifying the the drivers of of impacts of their operation. And so they can really act to try reducing the, the ecological footprint. So I, I will I will share more information on the chat, okay. I mean, links on, uh, on the chat, not to uh, lose too much time and to take too much time. And thank you everybody. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Serena. That was perfect. We, we Yeah, we've dug into the calculator. It is incredibly elaborate and also has all of the methodology there online. So do share the link so others can uh, check it out. It is also accessible through our online toolkit. All right, I see four more hands. This is working right now. So we're going to do four more and then we'll turn to Q&A. Um, so uh, Sophia Vincent, can we hear from you next? Yes, hello, hi everyone. I'm Sophia from the Green Office of the University of Liège in Belgium. Our Green Office is a platform to boost commitment to sustainable development by and for all members of our university. 
Uh, considering the current urgency, we have to act, and we, we know we should do it together and become active actors of the change. We try to create leverage effects throughout the institutions and their three missions, education, research, and citizenship. So we invite you to our next international event on the 8th of December. There will be many things going on during the COP28 and the World Climate Day, and this is the occasion for us to set up a big calculation for our individual carbon footprint. It will be a quick activity of 30 minutes to understand the carbon footprint and act in an informed way to reduce our CO2 emissions. We will organize and lead the whole activity. All you have to do is to invite as many members of your region as possible, communicate them the information we'll provide you, and obviously to connect and join us on the D-Day. If you want to know more, we are sending you a link in the chat that goes to a form of uh, 30 seconds to fill it in, uh, where you will get more information and where you can register and uh, if you are interested to participate in the project or if you want to know more. Thank you for listening to me and have a wonderful day. One last thing, remember it's only a beginning and if you think you are too small to be effective, then you have never been in a bed with a mosquito. <laughs> Perfect. I think we can all relate to that experience. Thank you so much. Please do share the link. And I hope, Sophia, that you might join our community of practice because it's exactly those kind of initiatives that we're working on toward through the whole year, you know, in the lead up to big events like COP28 um, that we'd love to cultivate a joint shared environment for everybody. Um, yes, it's Zael Gomez. Could I uh, open up? Thank you. Perhaps not available. All right, I was on too good of a streak there. We had to have a, a hiccup. Um, Samuel Sherman, would you like to uh, come on? I just unmuted you. Hi, everybody, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, um, I'm so excited to be here with, with all of you guys who had some amazing presentation, especially um, with uh, Professor Jeffrey Sachs as well too. But um, just to you know, be very brief, um, um, out here, we are developing a very, um, it's, it's in its embryonic stage, it's a solar initiative that we're developing and we um, promoting responsible consumption and production practice, which is um, goal 12, but at the same time elaborating on uh, goal seven, you know. So um, at the, for the moment, we can't we're kind of building network, working with a couple of universities, students, and while at the same time, um, Looking forward to some other initiatives that um, are in the pipeline, but uh, our goal is to make sure that we are reducing uh, carbon footprint, including um, advancing and elaborating on responsible consumption production practices. I think the most important thing about um, um, this climate initiative is also about changing of perception. You know, if we can change perception and behavior, we can be able to influence change because I like the, uh, pre the presenter from uh, from SDS and she said uh, resistance to change um, is a very complicated thing in change and that's where climate justice comes in. But uh, with all of the the, the conversation and and, uh, and action that is going on globally, is having an effective change which is going on gradually. I am very excited to be here and I'm looking forward to also networking with you guys. Perfect. Samuel, where are you calling from? Sorry, I think I missed and I should have uh, encouraged others to share their institution. Calling from Columbia, Maryland. Thank you. Sure. Great. Okay, last one and we'll go to Q&A. Um, Mwanya uh, Hussein, I apologize if I didn't uh, pronounce your name correctly. Oh, oh, sorry. Tr try again. We, I think we muted you. Okay. Yes, there you go. Okay. Uh, greeting for all. Um, thank you very much for this um, presentation. Uh, I, I have a, a small question and then a comment. Uh, the first question is uh, how private universities can create a system and inducive uh, uh, environment where students and faculty can contribute to achieve net zero campus given the limited resources and uh, financial restrictions, especially of private university in um, uh, such uh, third world countries. I mean, Oman, okay, it's considered a developing country. 
how can we do that? Uh, other issue, if we can incorporate uh, this issue in the curriculum, how to convince the uh, administrative or top administration to incorporate such issues in the curriculum of the university, then we can, uh, I think we can spread over the uh, uh, knowledge, skills to students, to faculty, and from that, we can also to spread it to or transfer it to other uh, industrial companies like this in the area. Thank you very much. I hope that I not see the 60 seconds. No, you did great. That was a wonderful segue to our Q&A part. So I'll actually ask Devon, SD, and Luki to please come on, join me. Oh, and Julie as well. Uh, turn your cameras on. Uh, would anybody like to kick us off and try to answer Mr. Huzan's uh, question there about how to create that system, that ecosystem of collaboration to really get started on these kinds of initiatives? No. Luki, could I ask maybe, can you share where the uh, impetus for your net zero strategy came from at your university? how it originated? Um, yeah, it, it was the British embassy <laughs> in Bolivia that uh, really pressed us just before the COP, uh, I don't know how many, in Glasgow. <laughs> they wanted uh, some universities to sign up and, and we agreed. And, uh, and, and well, just to, to talk about maybe what we did to involve the students and faculty uh, at last year's uh, annual conference uh, of, on sustainable development, we made a special session presenting the, the carbon emissions problems <laughs> on our campuses and, and made some working groups uh, just to, to develop solutions. And that was really quite a lot of fun and, and a lot of people participating. So that was a good way to involve people. Um, Elena. Yeah, uh, please. Right. Um, I I don't think I caught the the fullness of 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 his um of his his, his query, but based on Luke's point, what what I can certainly say for uh, Mona is it 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 has been a journey, and 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 let me contextualize it. So we recognize that we wanted to increase our capacity in in. in in operational output, but but we recognized as well that given the reduction in 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 in, in government subvention, we, we we needed to be more creative in terms of our operational activities. Layered on that as well is the the, the whole the whole the whole matter of how as a small developing Caribbean state that we can respond while we need to expand our operation how we can you know respond to the, the the climate change so you have for example um our 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 current principal who um has been an advocate an ardent advocate in how is it that um we can embed uh climate change and if you remember as part of my uh presentation how is it that you you can know you, you have it at certain levels within the enterprise but how is it now you can now incorporate it at the governance level where it becomes part of the discussion point um, throughout the entire enterprise? So it's all interrelated. So, so, so it is a journey and, and, and is to get, you know, certainly uh, leaders in, in, in the various facet to, 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 to have that buy-in and, and to have that conversation and to build out and to incorporate into your, your, your overall, um, uh, governance um, infrastructure. And, and, and finally, I'll give you an example. Um, th there is another project that I I, I, I could have um, highlighted and um, an another location um, on the island, um, on the North Coast, um, a microgrid. Again, um, that's an initiative by the, by the current principal in how is it that you can remove yourself slowly away from the grid, the grid, um, the national grid that is, right? and incorporating solar. So we know with that uh, 652 acres, how is it now we can replicate it 
right? So as I pointed out, they're just starting to have that conversation, right? Get the buy-in, get that, and get that engagement. I hope that um, answered the question provided. I think it is helpful. Um, I also think it's a good segue. I see a few questions uh, on financing and, and how to really mobilize financing to support this. This is, we're talking about large shifts um, in the operations and also potentially infrastructure at universities. So uh, maybe share a little bit about how uh, you've either created the right business model or um, put together creative financing. How are these projects being financed? Esti was, I mean, maybe we start with you, just uh, the yes, app, for example. Perhaps yeah. I can connect this question with the previous one. I agree with both, with Devon and with like, because um, I think that uh, they, both of them, they underline that this is a process. So we cannot move from 100 to zero. <laughs> it's a long process. And, and also both of them, they highlighted that it's something that we have to do together. So I think that it's very important to combine top-down strategies with bottom-up strategies and to involve all the university community because if not, it's not successful. Not not the one, not the first ones bottom-up and not the, the second ones top-down. And regarding the financial resources, sometimes, and I find it in my university, it's okay if we cannot invest so much money in renewable energies, we cannot produce energy. But now with the crisis, because of the because of the problems that we have now with Ukraine and with Russia, we with structural changes, changing or reducing the temperature in our offices and doing a lot of things, we have reduced the energy consumption nearly to a half. So yes. <laughs> Uh, so yes, uh, it's important to invest. It's important, uh, or we need uh, we need uh, financial resources. But sometimes when, and this is urgent, uh, if we have to do something, sometimes with structural changes, we can uh, we can advance a lot. And it's uh, this I would say uh, we have to do it together. It's a long process, but we have to do it quickly. And uh, not just uh, investments, new technologies, new uh, sources of uh, renewable energies, also changes in our daily habits, in our offices, in, in our... Sometimes we have to sacrifice <laughs> some of our unsustainable habits. It's very true. It's what makes this such a hard conversation, right? We're talking about personal decisions and, and lifestyles. Julie, my, maybe I could ask you to chime in here because I think um, all too often we underestimate the power of our student bodies and the real action that they're able to either advocate for or actually implement themselves. Do you have uh, any examples you might want to share with us of like what how students might be involved in these different themes as project implementation or finance or even just um, getting people to do behavior change, obviously really challenging. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that question. I think students are definitely an underused resource on campus, even though they are ready and passionate to contribute to decarbonization efforts across universities and colleges, because in a lot of cases, they these campuses are actually their homes, right? They want to be able to not only improve the well-being of the places they're living in, but also um, all of the time and energy that they're spending in for so many years. But there's a lot of different ways that students can be engaged. And I encourage you to check out our guide for more information, but I can definitely highlight some um, just to give you an idea. I think you know, having student sustainability 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 leaders be invited um, to present at board and committee meetings and to fully participate in campus sustainability committees, offering student employee positions in sustainability and other offices, you know, creating student sustainability coordinator positions that facilitate collaborations um, among different departments with students, you know, students can act as liaisons between administration, faculty, staff, and student organizations to make sure that they're engaged throughout different processes and projects. So that's a way to really integrate student engagement into actual governance um, arrangements, like I mentioned earlier. But, you know, students can also be part of climate action through different student organizations that can be established. They can be part of service learning and community 
service opportunities um, through their studies to actually not only benefit their own institutions, but also their wider communities. So there's a lot of different ways to get them involved. And students want that opportunity. You know, they want to build on what they're learning in the classroom and have an impact in their community. So um, it's definitely a huge opportunity to help accelerate the decarbonization journey. Great. Thank you for that answer. Does anybody else want to comment on the role of students at all? Or have you worked with them in your different initiatives that you presented? Um, Devon, I see a few questions here. On, people are very curious about the net, the zero uh, emissions building that you uh, presented. Do you want to maybe provide a little bit more uh, context there of how that was accomplished? All right. So the the two uh, project sponsors uh, they recognize the need of um, starting this initiative and. Um, Certainly here at Mona, um, they they approached the campus um, leadership, but but what was very important then is actually having the engagement at the international level, seeking the necessary uh, or drumming up the necessary support, um, particularly for the financial the financial support um, um, that would be required. And it's through the efforts of um, that 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 international engagement that we were able to um, uh, identify the funding. Uh, what we what we had to do certainly in um, the implementation process was to get the various um, expertise and those expertise as well. We had to um, purchase from overseas um, to assist us to guide us in in how is it that we can you know, design and, you know, construct um, uh, uh, such, an, such an, an entity. So where we are now is really to um, operationalizing it so that, you know, certainly getting the, the data, um, carrying out the necessary research um, and presenting these findings so that we can advance it, the, the conversation. In fact, what, what, one conversation that is, that, that, that is required um, as well now is certainly the engagement with the government um, how is it that they can 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 receive this information? How is it that they can tap into they utilizing it in terms of their uh, infrastructure agenda as part of the vision 20, 2030? So what we are looking at is within and providing, um, as um, Prof. Sash said, that thought leadership in how it is that it can um, expand to the wider community. That was a great promo for our community of practice, right? We can't all be architects or economists or financiers or, you know, Absolutely. specialists. Absolutely. We need to work together so that we can Absolutely. share our Absolutely. expertise. Absolutely. Great. I'm just conscious of the time here. Before I turn it over to Maria, um, uh, Esti or Luki or Julie, do you want to, any final words or we will turn to our close? No? I would just encourage everyone to check out our resources in our toolkit and to share your own to help build um, our library out to cover all of the different topics that were brought up during our discussion. Perfect. All right, then without further ado, I will welcome our Vice President of Networks, uh, Maria Cortez Push, uh, to maybe share a few final words with us. Thank you, Maria, for joining us and thank you for all of your leadership. Uh, you're at the heart of cultivating this global network and why big part of the reason we're all here today. So would love to turn it over to you to for some closing remarks. Thank you, Elena. And thank you, everyone, for such a rich and interesting discussion. It's been fantastic. Uh, special thanks to our panelists, of course, and everyone that jumped in in that Q&A uh, sort of improvised uh, session. And of course, thank you uh, to Monash University, to Climate Works Center and their staff, as well as colleagues at SDSN, including obviously e e Elena and Julie. Uh, as well as the advisory panel. So universities are becoming pioneers and role models in the energy transition. It's been said already, uh, more than 1,000 colleges and universities around the world have committed to reaching net zero emissions. And at SDSN, we interact daily with universities. We have, uh, and I think it's been mentioned also, more than 1,800 member institutions. And we see daily the passion and the determination with which 
the presidents of the university, administrators, professors, but also the students uh, approach this uh, particular issue. However, we also recognize that this is not an easy transformation. It's extremely complex. It's not a question of undertaking a small optimization of one specific process. It's rather a question of how we can do things completely different, right? Um, this became very apparent today with the case that uh, Devon presented. Um, this is one of those wicked challenges. And we also have an extremely short timeline. Um, so this is exactly what led us to uh, get together with Monash and with uh, the Climate Works Center to develop this guide. Besides the passion that we sense from our colleagues at universities, we were also sensing this thirst um, for resources and also for opportunities to get together and share experiences. Um, so the guide was designed in principle to be suitable for academic institutions of very different sizes, very different regions and different stages of their decarbonization journey. Of course, it's not the panacea. It's a bit of a starting point. Um, and this is why today's conversation was very important. And it's, by the way, the second that we host today. We hosted another one for the Eastern Hemisphere. And we hope it's the, it's the first one of many, because as it was said today, too, we need to work together. So um, this is something that came across in most of the comments, that sharing experiences, sharing tools, and sharing resources is so important in such a complicated journey. So... I think uh, I'll, I'll finish with uh, encouragement to all of you to stay tuned through our website, our social media, our newsletter. If your university is not yet a member of SDSN, it may be interested, interesting for you to consider joining as we will be setting up this community of practice that has been already mentioned. Um, and because we're already one minute uh, after the hour, I'll say goodbye to you now. Uh, check out the resources that have been shared. And uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us. Over to you, Elena. No, that was perfect. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. And please go do something meaningful and share your passion with your family, your friends, and celebration of Earth Day this weekend. Thanks, everyone. Okay, all the best. Bye. <laughs>